grow where you're planted. That's our thought for today. Welcome. It's another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot as she called us to live to a higher standard each day. Not satisfied with throwing a little religion into our lives as a shallow substitute for God's best. As this podcast series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others who are influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. We'll sometimes get a behind-the-scenes look at what she was like as we think again about the love story of Jim and Elizabeth. And we'll hear from one of Elizabeth's caretakers in her latter years, Samantha Legoy, and what comes to her mind, four things, when she thinks of Elizabeth. A quick word from Kathy Gilbert, who Elizabeth called her hippie friend. When she hears Elizabeth's name, what does Kathy think about? And speaking of that, Margaret Ashmore, artist, speaker, and friend of Elizabeth, talks about what comes to her mind when she hears Elizabeth's name. Right now, it's Gateway to Joy number 105, Context of Fruit Bearing. You know, Jim Elliott, you may think of him as a spiritual giant, but he was a a human being and he had plenty of downtimes in his spiritual life. Things weren't always ideal. Darkness, how can it be helpful? Join us. The Context of Fruit Bearing now. I'm taking my illustrations for this talk from the love story of Jim Elliott and me. I told you a little bit about its beginnings in my last talk and how we thought that perhaps in spite of the fact that we were in love, God might possibly be leading us both into the single life as being the necessary context in which we were to serve him because we both knew that there are kinds of missionary work which require singleness, and in spite of our feelings for each other, we were not closing our minds to the possibility that this was the direction in which God was leading us. And we both had plenty of spiritual ups and downs. If you read parts of Jim's journals, you would think that he was a spiritual giant at the age of 20. You read other parts and you find out that he was really a very ordinary, down-to-earth guy with plenty of downs. And I remember being encouraged by one of Jim's letters in which he told me that while he was visiting in the East, doing a little bit of speaking just before he left for the mission field, he had visited a man who raised chrysanthemums in his basement. And one of the things that this man told Jim, which rang a bell immediately in Jim's mind and made him think of a hymn which he had memorized, was the fact that there are certain periods when the chrysanthemums need to be in the dark. And Jim then remembered a phrase from what is called Rutherford's Hymn. It's written by Annie, our cousin. But she took the 20 verses of her hymn, The Sands of Time Are Sinking, from the writings of Samuel Rutherford. And he had spoken about the need of flowers for darkness. And her stanza goes like this, But flowers need night's cool darkness, the moonlight and the dew. So Christ, from one who loved it, his shining oft withdrew. And when, for cause of absence, my troubled soul I scanned, yet glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. And Jim wrote to me shortly after that that God had assuaged all doubt in his mind about his feelings for me. He said, I covenanted with the Father that he would do either of two things, either glorify himself to the utmost in me or slay me. By his grace, I shall not have his second best, for he heard me, I believe, so that now I have nothing to look forward to but a life of sacrificial sonship. He cannot fail us. He may lead us oceans apart, and can we not trust him for that too? But are we so childish, I do not say childlike, as to think that a God who could scheme a Jesus plan would lead poor pilgrims into situations they could not bear? May he not so often have to address us as, O oh, you of little faith. Our expectations of the ways in which God works are very often unrealistic, wildly wide of the mark. Some think that God works magic and expect him to move in and change things or change people. We all would like to see him do that at times, wouldn't we? 
we find ourselves in a difficult situation. We start hammering and banging away at God's door. Do something, Lord. Get me out of this. Get that person out of my life. Change this situation. Give me a different job. Give me another house. And God doesn't necessarily move in and change anything as far as we can see. Then there are others who look for spiritual opportunities in the form of new contexts. They feel that if they could just get out of this situation, away from this set of circumstances, then perhaps they could serve God. It's not in these ordinary circumstances and tasks that I want to serve him. It's in those. Well, let me read again from one of Jim's journal entries, November 20th, 1950. They made me a keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. So the lover of the song. He was quoting from the Song of Solomon. How I experience this daily, only one who knows responsibility can understand. You wonder what it's all about. Excuse me, I think I said this was a journal entry. This was actually a letter to me. Here are some typical examples. Foreign Missions Fellowship team to Aurora College, three meetings for planning and prayer. Complete reorganizing of Foreign Missions Fellowship literature. Plans for advertising a new practical missions course under Professor Windsor and Dr. Martin. Gospel team to the Baptist Church in Chicago Sunday night. Student council meeting Monday night. Prayer group leaders and relief board meeting Tuesday. FMF Wednesday, Christian Council meeting Thursday, trip to North Central College with student council. Friday, FMF executive prayer meeting, then the sending of 800 packages of books to alumni missionaries in a workshop that lasted till 11.30 p.m. and they're not stamped yet. Well, I think you get the idea. A yoke is a good thing for a young man, according to Lamentations 3.27, good for his neck and will, but oppressive to a zealous spirit especially when I'm supposed to be an honor student and there's not a single course of which I can say, well, I've got that one under control. And ringing in my ears is Coach Olson's last remark, why weren't you out to practice last night, Elliot? This is, I know, a wonderful context in which to bear spirit fruit. Let me ask you this. Do you live in a wonderful context in which to bear spirit fruit? The answer is yes, you do, whether you realize that or not. What is spirit fruit? Well, according to the book of Galatians, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, fidelity, tolerance, self-control. Have you got those fruits in your life? Just take the first three, for example, love, joy, peace, well, some of the time, you could say, once in a while, I act in true love, unselfishly. Joy, well, yeah, things aren't really too bad. I have a lot of happiness. No, I'm not talking about happiness. The fruit of the Spirit is joy, which doesn't depend on happiness. Peace, how peaceful, how serene is your life. Patience, what is the context in which you would expect to learn patience. How is God going to enable you to bear the fruit of the Spirit, which is patience? The story is told of a woman who came to, I think it was Dr. Ironside, and said, Brother, please pray that God will give me patience. I need patience. And so he put his arm on her shoulder and he said, Oh, Lord, send this dear sister all kinds of tribulation." Wait, 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 she said, that's not what I asked for. I need patience. And he said, how would you expect to learn it? The scripture says, tribulation worketh patience. Temptation comes in the form of the opposites of these fruits. And the opposites can easily be found exactly in the context where you and I are living today. Love, for example. Well, think of the opposite. I live with a husband now. I've lived without a husband for most of my life, but right now I have one. And I don't think there's ever a time when I really think that I hate Lars, but there are times when I actually act in a hateful way. I got very upset with him yesterday. 
I wanted to really get back at him and make him realize that he had irritated me and hurt me. What is the response of love? The temptation came to me in the form of vindictiveness and revenge. That is the very context in which God wants to teach me how to love. I can't do it by myself. It's a fruit of the Spirit. The opposite of love is not necessarily hatred, but a small selfishness. What about joy? What are the temptations which come in the form of the opposites? Well, just plain grumpiness. Do you ever feel grumpy, out of sorts? Don't talk to me, I haven't had my coffee yet kind of thing. A spirit of complaining, the opposite of joy. Peace? What is the temptation that comes to you today in the context where you are living? The opposite of peace is anxiety. Are you worried about anything? Jesus said, don't worry about anything whatsoever. Take no thought for tomorrow. The morrow will take thought for the things of itself. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Patience. Well, I was in the checkout line yesterday in a grocery store. Does it ever fail if you're in a hurry that you get into the line where somebody's check has to be taken over to the customer service desk to be checked out, or the cashier has just run out of quarters and so she has to stop everything in the cash box until she gets some quarters? Something happens. The context of fruit bearing is the grocery checkout line. You ever get stuck in a traffic jam when you've got an appointment? What kind of context do we think would be more fruitful than the very one in which we live? Fidelity, tolerance, self-control. There is no better context than the place where you are right now because God will always see to it that you and I are in the very set of circumstances which are best designed by his sovereign love to give us the opportunity to bear fruit for him. Gateway to Joy 105, the context of fruit bearing. Samantha Lagoy was one of the caretakers for Elizabeth, especially in her last days. Samantha, what comes to mind when you think of Elizabeth? When I hear Elizabeth's um, name, what is the first thing that comes to my mind? Surrendered peaceful, joyful, encouraging. One of Elizabeth's caretakers, Samantha Lagoy. Thank you, Samantha. And speaking of that, Margaret Ashmore, artist, speaker, and friend of Elizabeth, talks about what comes to her mind when she hears Elizabeth's name. Well, it, it's kind of an old-fashioned word, but I like it. It's the word redoubtable or stalwart, though I know she was very much human and I think sometimes vulnerable and certainly wrestled with the forces of this fallen world, as do we all. She was immovable in her faith, had her gaze transfixed on Jesus, and never wavered from her message of the cross and its transforming power. Well, later on, we'll hear from Kathy Gilbert, a good friend of Elizabeth, as she talks about what comes to her mind when she hears the name Elizabeth. And uh, a quick thought about femininity. Uh, we'll have that later. First, though, it's the second of our Gateway to Joy programs for this podcast. It's number 106, What I Need to Know for Now. Hey, have you ever wanted a complete outline of God's plan for your life? What exactly will happen? Well, then maybe you can relate to Elizabeth and her thoughts today. Her excitement at missionary life did not include single missionary life. And a reminder to do what you can do and let God do what you cannot do. Have you ever wished that the Lord would give you a complete outline of his plan regarding something you're very worried about? Tell you exactly what he's going to do and what you have to do? how it will all end, I have. I certainly was in that position when I was madly in love with Jim Elliott, and Jim Elliott was making noises about being single for the rest of his life. That was the last thing I wanted to hear. 
I was hoping that God was going to give me the privilege of being a missionary, and it certainly looked as if that was the direction he was taking me. But I wanted to know now, where is it going to be, Lord? Africa? South Pacific? Certainly not Latin America. That was one thing I was very sure about. Every time I had had to make a choice in school of a language course, I avoided Spanish because I was perfectly sure that Spanish was one language I would never have any use for. But this business of marriage, you know, it's one thing to say, yes, Lord, I'll be a missionary. That's exciting. That's the most thrilling way in my mind of serving God if he gives you that opportunity. But the idea of being a spinster missionary was not to my taste at all. So when I fell in love with Jim Elliott, it would have been very easy to think we're both headed in the same direction, we're both going to the mission field, we're both interested in linguistics, we both majored in classical Greek, we're both members of the Foreign Mission Fellowship, we're both in love. Why would we ever doubt that God wants us to be together? We knew that our feelings were a perfect tornado, and we didn't dare take them into our own hands. We laid them before God and asked him to do whatever he wanted to do with them. But this was one of those times when I wanted to know what he was going to do with them. I wanted God to give me an assurance that, yes, it will be a long wait, but I'm going to give you Jim Elliott as a husband, somehow, somewhere, sometime. He didn't tell me that. You know what he said to me? Trust me. Trust me. I know what I'm doing. I've got the whole world in my hands. I love you. When Israel was encamped beside the sea, with the Egyptians approaching, and all Pharaoh's army and horsemen and chariots coming after them, they were terrified. They complained to Moses, you're the one that brought us out into this wilderness to die. And here we are in an impossible situation. The sea in front of us, the Egyptians behind us. No place to go, no way out. They were in a panic. And do you remember what God told Moses to do? He gave him three things to do. Lift up your rod, stretch out your hand, divide the sea. Now, there were two of those things that Moses could certainly do. He could lift up his rod. He could stretch out his hand. But divide the sea? Divide the sea? No way could Moses possibly divide the sea. But you know, it's very easy to get all hung up wondering how God is going to fulfill his promises to us. Or wondering how in the world we're going to do something which he is clearly commanding us to do. The answer is to do what you can do. And then God will do what you can't do. So what did Moses do? When God said to do three things, Moses immediately started. He lifted up his rod. He stretched out his hand. And I don't know at what precise point it was that God made the waters roll back like two walls on two sides of a road. All we know is Moses lifted up his rod, stretched out his hand, and divided the sea. Was it Moses who divided the sea, or was it God? God gets a lot of things done via us, by the instrumentality of us, his human, fallible, helpless creatures. And the way he does it is through our simple obedience in the thing that he tells us to do that we can do. If you're in a position where you feel as though you need to know something about the will of God, let me encourage you by saying you do know what you need to know right now. You know at least one thing that you can do. Do that, and you will be amazed to see what God has in mind for the next step. When Jim was a senior at Wheaton College, he went to the first Urbana Convention. This is a large student missionary convention held between Christmas and New Year's, sponsored by InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. This convention continues to this day. It's held every three years. And Jim wrote to me. I was in Bible school in Canada 
of the convention's significance for him personally. The Lord has done what I wanted him to do for me this week. I wanted primarily a piece about going into pioneer Indian work. As I analyze my feelings now, I am quite at ease about saying that tribal work in the South American jungle is the general direction of my missionary purpose. Also, I am confident that God wants me to begin jungle work single. Can you imagine how my heart sank when I read that? Those are some good-sized issues to get settled finally in a week. And then, a couple of weeks later, he wrote this. My decision was based on seeing a man from central Brazilian jungles who has done a work comparable to the sort I feel exercised for. He told of the impossibility of marriage in his particular context. That was all. No voices, no scripture, just the settled piece of decision which often comes to the exercised soul. I will not say God is leading me to a life of celibacy. I only know what I need to know for now, and that is that the Lord does not want me seeking a wife until I have his definite sign, and apparently there is no immediate reason to expect that sign. Let me tell you a story. When I returned from Birdsong last January, this is Jim still talking in his letter to me, and Birdsong was the name of the home where I lived in New Jersey, my father being an amateur ornithologist. He loved watching birds, and so we named our house Birdsong. Jim says, when I returned from Birdsong last January, I had fallen or grown very much into an attachment to the girl you know better than anyone else. Because of heart-searching I had had regarding God's use of those who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom's sake, I determined that none should know of my affinity for that girl, even though it was evident that we should be much together. I can remember confessing to the Lord what I called my love for her and striving daily to forget and swallow hard. In those days of decision to keep silence, it seemed as if I had sealed the course of my whole life, and I must confess I felt as if I were somewhat of a martyr. There came to me then this song, Why should I droop in sorrow? Thou art ever by my side. Why, trembling, dread the morrow? What ill can e'er betide? If I my cross have taken, tis but to follow thee. If scorned, despised, forsaken, naught severs me from thee. And in my hymn book there is a blue line drawn with the date, as I have indicated. Dearest Betty, I charge you in the name of our unfailing friend, do away with all waverings, bewilderment, and wonder. You have bargained for a cross, overcome anything in the confidence of your union with him. So the contemplating trial, enduring persecution or loneliness, you may know the blessings of the joy set before. We are the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And what are sheep doing going into that gate? What is their purpose inside those courts? To bleat melodies and enjoy the company of the flock? No, those sheep were destined for the altar. Their pasture feeding had been for one purpose, to test them and fatten them for bloody sacrifice. Give him thanks, then, that you have been counted worthy of his altars. Enter into the work with praise. This letter roused in me the old fear that I might be the means to turn Jim aside from God's purpose for him. And I wrote again, asking if he was really sure that we were right to continue our correspondence. He was sure. God has led us together in writing, he wrote, and I have no sign that his will is anything else than that we continue. If such a course leads ultimately to a more bitter renunciation than withdrawal just now should mean, the more bitter way is to be God's way. Remember Mara, and the Lord showed him a tree which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. The cloud led Israel to Mara. What do we need to know right now? One thing to do. If there's nothing else, there is still one thing, and that is the greatest thing that God ever asks of any man or any woman. Trust in the living God. Trust me, he says. Go to sleep in peace. Do your work with joy. I'll show you 
when the time comes. Just do away with your doubtings, go on, do the thing you know, and God will show you the thing you don't know. He led Jim and me one step at a time. He led Israel one step at a time. When Moses lifted up the rod and stretched out his hand, two apparently useless things, God divided the sea. God will always show you one thing you can do now. Remember that every experience, if offered up to Jesus, can be your gateway to joy. Gateway to Joy 106, what I need to know for now. A good friend of Elizabeth Elliot was Kathy Gilbert. So if you know Elizabeth well, what comes to your mind when you hear that name, Elizabeth Elliot? One of the things that comes to mind when I hear Elizabeth's name is her stand on femininity. And uh, for an example, this is a quote from her, to me, a lady is not frilly, flouncy, flippant, frivolous, or fluff-brained. But she is gentle, she is gracious, she is godly, and she is giving. You and I have the gift of femininity. The more womanly we are, the more manly men will be, and the more God will be glorified. Be women, be only women, be real women in obedience to God. Isn't that powerful? Oh, boy, what a timely message from her for us today. One of Elizabeth's good friends. That was Kathy Gilbert. And friend, thank you for being a part of our podcast today, which is coming to an end. Let me thank you, though, before we run out of time, for letting us come into your life today. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, we presented this podcast where we encourage you to check out the resources at elizabethelliott.org. Elizabeth Elliot is my hero and my friend, and how grateful I am for her website, elizabethelliot.org, where you have access to all her resources, her teaching, her books, all the recommendations, her newsletters, and pictures. I love that they've captured so many of the pictures. And follow Elizabeth Elliot Foundation on social media, and you'll get the benefit of quotes from her, pictures from her, and fall in love with Elizabeth Elliot for yourself. Until next time, may God remind you daily that you are loved with an everlasting love, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Mm -hmm.